morning. I'm Heather Staines, the Director of Partnerships for Hypothesis, an open source nonprofit collaboration technology. And I'm happy to bring you today four speakers um, who will be talking about the promise and the perils of artificial intelligence. Um, our plan for this session is to keep the presentations brief because we do want the, the bulk of the time to focus on conversations with you. Um, I'll just introduce the speakers briefly. Um, we have uh, Ian Mulvaney. He's the head of product innovation for Sage. He's going to do a brief intro on what is AI. Um, I sort of think that these days it either seems like everything is AI, so nothing is. Um, Ian's going to help clarify that for us. Um, he'll then be followed by Peter Brantley, um, who is the director of online strategy for the University of California, Davis, um, and I think well known at this conference. Our third speaker is Ruth Pickering. She's the managing director for UNO. You know. And then our fourth speaker is Elizabeth Cayley. She is a director at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative working on the Meta Project, and she'll be joining us uh, remotely. Do we have Elizabeth? Just checking? Yeah. Awesome. All right, without uh, further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ian. OK, hello, everybody. Um, I've promised to teach you what AI is in five minutes, so I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to have a little a couple of slides about some personal reflections on where we are with AI. Uh, green. Oh, the big one. OK, what is AI? OK, so um, OK, good. So, so, so just some context. We have a lot of data. And AI is just one of a number of different methodologies for dealing with data at scale. So I put up like four classes of how today we can deal with data at scale. I'm not going to go into these in any detail. But what I think is really interesting about these different four classes of how we deal with data at scale these days is there are open source tools that are available for all of those types of classes of ways of dealing with that data. And I think that's really fascinating. Um, so when we think about AI, one of the really key models is machine learning and deep neural networks. And they're pretty simple conceptually. So you start with some training data, my letter A here, and I've got a model. And the model actually has no correlation whatsoever to the training data. And you start by asking, what's the difference? And then you get a difference, a, a delta, between your model and your training data. And then that feeds back into the model. But you train your model with a huge number of examples of that training set. And the differences compile up, and that model gets richer and richer and richer. And eventually, you can ask questions like, oh, that was meant to be a picture of a cat at the top. And you can ask questions of, of like, is my test data correlated to my model? And can I tell from my test data whether this thing is an A, or whether it's a cat, or whether it's not an A? And so we build up these models by just training our system with this test data. And that is what machine learning is, in, in a nutshell. Um, <clears throat> Now, one of the key changes that's happened over the last couple of years is over time, we're seeing a huge amount of data becoming available and the cost of computation coming down radically. And so we can train these models with large data sets and run those computations very cheaply. And that allows us to get to a place where these models are becoming very powerful. And so with these models, we can do things like explore data. So the models are very good at doing things like identifying objects in images. We can do face detection. Uh, we can do prediction. Uh, these uh, models have been very good at beating humans at, at tasks like playing Go uh, because they can predict ahead what plays that the opponent will be able to make. And they can even be used to generate new kinds of information and data. So the bottom is an example of an image that's been generated from an ab, ab initio model. Now, sometimes these machines don't get things quite right. So on the left, we have an example of image identification, which was identifying people as gorillas. On the right-hand side, we have an example of a prediction algorithm, which was predicting that only white people could win at beauty contests. So we have to be careful with how we train these models. Um, also, if you know how the model is built, you can create data that inputs into the model that confuses the hell out of it. So on the left-hand side, we have a picture of a cat, but the machine thinks it's an avocado. And on the right-hand side, we have a 3D model of a 
turtle, but the machine thinks it's a gun. And so, so you know, we have, you know, to be careful about, about how we construct these models. But it is really just as simple as, you know, training with lots of data examples to create this model, which is then used to do these kinds of tasks. So now I hope you all know what AI is. <laughs> Now I'm going to talk about some of my own reflections on, on what I'm doing and my thoughts on where we are with AI, B very brief. So uh, I'm head of product innovation at Sage. Some of those problems that I identified earlier come from a lack of an understanding of how to train data well. So we think at Sage that it's really important to get social scientists involved in this mix. And so we're trying to support with tools that help get access to data, and, and, and skills, and so we launched this year an online learning platform to teach social scientists how to program. Um, now, where are we with respect to AI at the moment? This guy on the left is a guy called Henry Maudsley. He's one of my heroes. He invented a machine that allowed people to create nuts and bolts that were interoperable. Before Henry Maudsley, every single nut and bolt in the world could only work with the one that it was built for. They were not interoperable. And that kind of led to the creation of the Industrial Revolution. That's where we are today with AIs. AIs are handcrafted, they are extremely delicate, there's a dark art, but we're about to approach an era where they are becoming productionized. And so I think we're right on the cusp of seeing them filter into many, many areas of our lives. And then my last slide is, I, however, remain an optimist. I think, I think that AIs are coming, but they will be friendly and they will help us deal with data at scale. Although I've been reading a few articles this week that has shaken my conviction on that a little bit, but I'm gonna remain optimistic and I'm gonna hand over to the next person on the panel. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Peter Brantley and thanks for coming. Uh, okay, so let me, okay. so. Um, that's me, um, and in this talk, I'm going to actually take the voice of doom and the dark side as a, a partial counterpart to um, Ian's more optimistic take, because both sides are present in AI, and both sides are really important, and we have to, you know, head into this world uh, very much eyes open. So I want to raise a couple of things that are maybe not immediately uh, present in our concerns, but are potentially looming uh, very soon. And I'll say also that I'm typically a technology uh, advocate and, a, and a, particularly a, a network advocate. Um, I got my start in networking uh, with a, a very pre-internet system called the CDC Plato, um, which unless you're at least of my age, you won't know anything about, but uh, I know Brewster does, and um, I think you will either have to look it up in Wikipedia or consult uh, Brewster's open library uh, to find some of the manuals for it. There is actually an emulator. Um, so, as Ian mentioned, AI works essentially by trying to derive patterns out of large masses of data. And when it does that, if it's trained well enough, it can make inferences out of that data. So, you know, there's, there's a famous um, inference of, oh, this looks like a cat. Um, but, you know, if, if you train an AI well enough and increasingly over more and more sophisticated problems, then those kinds of associations start to feel like insight something that heretofore had been the province of, of humans. And, and that's what's kind of unique and special. But fundamentally, and, and I don't think any serious AI practitioner would argue otherwise, you know, what an AI is doing is, is making an observation, drawing inferences out of correlations uh, of data, but those data may not be causal, even if something happens in a temporal um, you know, a timeline, right? So an AI sees one thing happening and then it sees another thing happening. You can't make the inference that first thing causes the second thing. So that's actually a very significant thing to keep in mind. Now, AI currently can be classified in two broad ways. Right now, we're working mostly with what practitioners call narrow AI. So a narrow AI is something that focuses on a particular kind of application, like a certain kind of image recognition, that kind of thing. So many of these kinds of AIs, particularly the ones that are now fairly sophisticated, um, are kind of non-interactive. They, they pull data together and then and they make uh, 
or they draw an inference. So I've given a couple of examples. One is um, you can string an airframe with a lot of sensors of uh, electromagnetic resistance, of temperature, and so forth. And so you can begin to draw an inference with lots of data experience of, well, maybe there's a, a potential crack forming in the airfoil. Um, you know, I need to signal, I, the AI, need to make a signal that that should be examined. Um, another example would be, as we start aging more in place, we're wearing more and more personal sensors, our homes are becoming full with Internet of Things devices that monitor ambient conditions. So it's certainly um, in, the, in the works that an AI will begin to synthesize those data, pull them together, and to start allowing us to make uh, inferences that, hmm, maybe I might be nearing a cardiac event, I need to signal a doctor or a caregiver to examine those kinds of things. So those are narrow AIs, and um, fortunately, you know, if, if we make a mistake in those AIs, typically those mistakes are fairly limited, um, either in scope or in time. Um, worst case, God forbid, the AI screws up in the aging home example, um, but we would learn from that and correct that and, and be able to um, do better next time without much consequence. But AI is increasingly invading areas of social interaction, and here is where I would start to raise a caution. So as, as AI start trending more toward what we call general or broad AIs that attempt to synthesize data across a much wider array of inputs and try to make a much broader uh, set of, of inferences available to us, then there's some elements of caution. So I, I give a couple of examples here. Um, by analyzing a wide swath of video and uh, textual data, can an AI suggest uh, from th this monitoring of a, a conservative political or religious group that an act of terror might be near, right? That's a much more difficult and more fraught kind of prediction. Um, similarly, by looking at um, food pricing indicators and um, uh, satellite uh, terrain uh, photography or imaging, you know, can an AI suggest that uh, a population is moving because of ecological stress or because of racial genocide, right? So these are much more profound uh, discussions um, and the impacts potentially are much more persistent than figuring out am I nearing a cardiac stress episode in my home? So I, I want to suggest, and this is my last slide, that bias is something more than just mere misclassification in AI. And it's really important for us to grapple with that. Because AI is informed by the societies in which it emerges, but it also informs back into the society. Right. Recently, uh, uh, one of the uh, founders of Facebook made uh, the observation that um, unknowingly, perhaps, or unpredictably to him as a founder, uh, the, sort of the growth of Facebook as a phenomenon has changed how we interact with each other. Right? So in a similar way, the emergence of AI changes how we make assumptions about our world. It changes how we make assumptions about how our machines, our computers, and how the network will talk back to us. And as a consequence, AIs have the threat of supporting hegemony, of violence, or exclusion of populations or segments of society if we get it wrong. And generally, in AI, there's a trade-off between an accuracy of an inference and the intelligibility of that AI itself. We are already entering a phase where AIs are in contest with other AIs in cybersecurity, and AIs are on the cusp of building other AIs. So I leave with a reference to the article that Ian mentioned in passing. Many of us have been reading over the last week an article by the British critic James Bridle, who observed that there is an emerging number of videos targeted to uh, very young children on YouTube that are very disturbing in um, sexual characterizations, violence, uh, depicted scenes of violence, and so forth. 
and that these videos seem to be a combination of both um, human and machine made, that they're algorithmically constructed in essence and then thrown into YouTube for consumption and discovery. So the, this kind of sort of dialectic between us and the network is becoming more and more pervasive and it enabled what Bridal described as infrastructural violence against our own society. So these are concerns that we can surmount, but we must bear them in mind as we, as we put our hands together to try to build these new intelligent systems that can serve us and move us forward rather than threaten us. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So I'm delighted to be here this morning talking to you. I work in technology, and we specialize in artificial intelligence. And last month, I was in London, and I was catching this taxi to the airport, and I was chatting to my driver. And he said to me, um, where do you live? So I said, actually, I live in California. Obviously, I sound very English, but I live in California. And he said, what do you do? I said, uh, I work in technology and AI. And he said, what? I said, artificial intelligence. He said, what? I said, algorithms. And it just really made me realize that actually AI is far, far from being mainstream. So when you're talking about AI, it's a bit like saying medicine. If you work in medicine, you could be a doctor, you could be a nurse, you could be a gynecologist, you could be a neurosurgeon, very, very different things. So what we specifically do is a blend of computational linguistics, graph theory, and machine learning. And what we're trying to do, and we often refer to ourselves rather than artificial intelligence is augmented intelligence. Because what we're really trying to do is help overcome some of the problems that people face every day. So one of the real challenges is the sheer volume of information that exists and that is created across a very, very wide range of sources that are often fragmented and dispersed. So how we use AI is that we ingest huge quantities of high quality information. And our algorithms read them all in a way that isn't possible for humans to read that quantity of information, both in terms of what already exists, what's been created historically, and what continues to be created on a day-by-day -day basis. Then we use AI to read the full text and extract meaning in the form of concepts. And then what we're trying to do is to recreate a neural network model. So we knit the concepts together in a big graph network. And so what you see is on the right this enormous multi-dimensional graph. And within the graph, it's entirely adaptive. So as new information is ingested, if a concept becomes related to another concept in terms of something that was published that day, that week, the graph will move. So a graph is a fantastically flexible mathematical instrument. And what's key is that it can be interrogated by different users for different purposes in many different ways. And so however you want to search for information or to find knowledge, you can put in a different query and a different element of that graph network will be surfaced. So I wanted to talk to you about a couple of different things and how we hope that they help people overcome this big problem around finding what they're looking for today. So in terms of how you can create products using artificial intelligence, starting off, you can take this huge quantity of data. And we take data across all kinds of different sources. It could be anything from a news feed to books to journal articles, reference sources. And we also ingest different languages. And then we run a series of algorithms across that data. And that creates this huge network of relationships. And what's really, really important is that part. So those relationships between all these different concept sources across all these different domains of information. And once you've built those relationships into this enormous graph network, you can use that in different ways. So a financial analyst can use it to search for trending news in their sector. A researcher can use it to understand connections in a particular field of research. And one of the things that we're particularly 
keen on trying to help people do is to uncover inferences across different domains of information. So if you go to a search bar today and you put in a query, and if you go to the right place and you put in a good query, hopefully you'll find the answer to your question, but you probably won't find something else. So we know statistically that 93% of people stay on the page one of their results list. And we also know that 63% of people take the first three entries only. But are they really the best sources of information that are available and that people could find? So using a graph visualization, what we're trying to do is give a completely different perspective to information to help people understand in a more intuitive way concepts, their relationships, the context, so the broader perspective of that area. And so the way in which we show information, and you can see in this visualization on the right, is really designed for people to understand the broader context. So you could put in any query, and you'll get a single node in the center, and then you'll get a concentric circle of nodes around that. And those are all related concepts. So as you look around, you can see if you find anything interesting to you, and anything you see is interactive and clickable. So you can click whether it's a concept or whether it's a relationship between concepts, and really try and understand. And in the research process, it's not just knowing that two things are connected, it's understanding the reason that they're connected, and ultimately being able to get back to the source information and understand the kind of key documents behind that. The other thing that you can do algorithmically is as you're reading the full text of documents, hmm, I think I'm missing a slide. Um, sorry, Peter. I'm, I'm going to give up going back, but what I was going to say is as you're reading the full text of documents, you can also categorize any document. So you can say, this book is 63% about engineering, of which developmental robotics is 34%, et cetera. So you can provide this fantastically accurate picture. Um, and one of the things I really like about AI and I like about the technology is that it is unbiased. So it is reading this huge quantity of information and it is able to accurately and consistently apply this kind of categorization and extract information in that consistent way. So really, hopefully, what we're going to be able to do in this space is to help people spend less time being frustrated, trying to look for the right website, trying to look for the right source of information, so that they can find what they're looking for more quickly and spend more time on their research and actually on the argument and thinking about it. So that's where we're trying to come at this from. But I'll now hand over back to Heather. Thanks. We'll try to find that missing slide so that it can be included in the presentations later. And next up, we have, I hope, Elizabeth. Hello. Take it away, Elizabeth. That's okay. Um, I hope everybody can see the slides. Please just interrupt me if I, the audio doesn't come through or the slides don't come through. Um, but first of all, good morning from San Francisco. Thanks so much for uh, allowing me to participate remotely. Um, it's really important to be able to be part of this panel. So thanks very much. We, um, at Chan Zuckerberg, what we've been focused on is how can we use different technologies, including artificial intelligence, to help scientists make new discoveries. Um, so our organization, Meta, is a company that was based in Toronto that had been around for seven years, um, really focused on the application of artificial intelligence on scientific literature in order to make solutions and tools for scientists. And we were acquired by Chan Zuckerberg, a philanthropy run here based in San Francisco um, earlier this year. So um, you'll hear similar patterns or themes, I think, between all of the, all of the presenters thus far. Um, but to, to start a little bit about why we've been doing this work as Meta and why Chan Zuckerberg is now doing this work um, is that we believe it's important to accelerate the impact of science by enabling sharing awareness and understanding of scientific knowledge uh, for free to all scientists and all consumers of scientific literature. Um, around the world. So how can we how can we make the fastest progress within the sciences um, by facilitating um, better understanding of the knowledge that's um, encapsulated within scientists' brains and in multiple sources, including scientific papers. So when Meta was started uh, several years ago now, um, the underlying premise was, how do you take the information that's um, within scientific literature and transform that to uh, meaningful, meaningful, easy to navigate, set of connections, uh, and then take that further to do then predictions about where science is headed or where a particular field is headed um, or uh, what uh, brand new papers that have been published are going to be really impactful within their field. 
So um, we've been focused on biomedicine to start with. So how do you take the 27 million papers that have been published in biomedicine over the last 200 years and transform them into a knowledge graph, which you've heard a little bit about so far this morning, um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with. How do you take all of that information and parse it, recognize everything that's going on, um, tease out the relationships, and then use that knowledge in order to predict uh, where things are going into the future. So we have built a knowledge graph. Um, every single time a brand new scientific paper gets published, um, our systems using artificial intelligence, using a series of machine learning algorithms, will process that paper within a minute or two and basically um, add its uh, contribution to scientific knowledge into the scientific knowledge graph. Um, and that uh, works just as well for uh, the, the 90th paper on breast cancer that will be published this week as it will be for the first paper that's ever um, published on a brand new concept. For example, say the first paper that was published on CRISPR. So uh, the only way to actually do this and do this at scale is something that we realized several years ago is to use machine learning and very specifically um, supervised machine learning, which um, a technique that, um, or a set of techniques that you, we've been mostly talking about this morning, so that it involves the ability to take um, large sets of data and apply them, uh, use them to train a model, and then use them to test how well that model has performed. So just to give you a, a flavor of the types of problems um, that are particularly well suited to, to the kind of work that we do, we use artificial intelligence to recognize and map entities. Again, you heard a little bit about this earlier. So when a term or a technique or a gene or a protein is mentioned within um, a piece of text, how do you recognize what that is, even though it might be referred to in many, many different ways across many different authors over time? Um, then another set of problems is how do you disambiguate um, authors, affiliations, papers, and again, there's lots of examples outside of our field. How do we know that this Jane Smith um, who published this paper is actually the same or different from that Jane Smith who has exactly the same name? Similar field, um, but may, may or may not be the actual same person. Um, that's something that machine learning and, and algorithms can be applied to. Um, third, generate recommendations. I think that's one of the most familiar for, for those of us who have ever been to an Amazon website or a Netflix website. Um, how do you use artificial intelligence in order to uh, generate recommendations for uh, users or the folks that are, are using it, consuming the information? Um, and then how do you predict on this information? So how do you take um, an individual uh, technique, say a new emerging technique, um, and predict how much impact it might have in the future? Well, you do that by modeling based on um, past events uh, and, and similar entities and how they have evolved over time. So then those predictions can then be hopefully help humans make decisions uh, and plan for what they might want to do um, based on probabilities of what might happen in the future. Um, and that is related to the last category here as well. How do you forecast um, what might be really impactful within a field? And given how fast science is moving, specifically biomedical science is moving, that's been a huge focus for us as well. So just in summary, um, what we've been trying to do um, is take machine learning, apply it to all of that scientific literature. Um, here's one example of how that's being used. This is Meta, um, which is uh, an application that will, is available for free for researchers in order to stay on top of their scientific research. So we're driving people back to reading the papers, but um, really helping them sort through that overwhelming amount of new information that's being generated every single day within the sciences. Um, so this is an example of an end result that can come out of uh, a machine learning program and a, a set of machine learning experts um, and, a, and a whole bunch of data. So with that, I will hand it back over to Heather. Thank you very much. Thanks to uh, all our speakers for filling, fulfilling their promise to keep their presentation short so we could leave um, additional time at the end for questions. I also want to give uh, an additional thanks to uh, John and Mark on the tech team for putting in such close attention to make sure that um, it would be an enjoyable experience for, for Elizabeth to participate and for you to listen to her. Um, I'm going to kick it off with a question. Uh, and those of you, if I would ask if you have questions, please use the microphone so that Elizabeth can hear you in particular. Um, my first question is actually for Elizabeth. Um, you mentioned a little bit about predictions and recommendations. I think, you know, we, we've all been asked on Amazon to buy that, that toaster when we already had a toaster and we kind of think, you know, yeah, recommendations, you know, that's just great. How would you characterize the recommendations and predictions 
that um, the AI technology you're working with, how does that differ from what we may have experienced in these other aspects of our lives, if, if indeed it's, it's all that different? Yeah, um, it's a great question. There, there's um, a lot of different uh, data sources you can look to, um, sort of that source data, in order to generate predictions. So a lot of what people are familiar with in their day-to-day -day lives online is um, uh, predictions based on previous um, similar users' behavior. So uh, it's, it's suggesting a toaster to you, even though uh, you might already have a toaster, um, because somebody else has, has gone ahead and done that. Our, our recommendations and predictions are generated differently. Um, everything we're doing currently is based on what's within the scientific text itself. Um, so, for example, um, a lot of the work that we do um, with our publisher partners is when a new manuscript gets um, submitted, um, we have the ability to analyze the manuscript over 500 different factors um, in the manuscript submission um, in order to provide more information to the editor about, um, about what's going on in that paper and give them more data in order to make a decision on how they want to proceed with peer review. Um, or if they want to present the interview or not. Um, so we're, um, we, within that, there are predictions. Within that, there's a, a lot of the other techniques um, I had mentioned earlier to make sure that we are um, properly representing what's within the paper to a high degree of accuracy. Um, but then at that point, uh, a, a very well-trained, specialized human, um, an editor, takes a look at the information that's been derived automatically um, and makes a decision on what, what to proceed with to go forward. And I think that's a a really big distinction probably for a lot of the, the questions or the subjects coming up um, uh, and alludes to some of the topics that were talked about a little bit earlier where we can provide, AI can provide more information for humans to make decisions um, and, and then there's other sets of systems that are starting to do things automatically for us and we have to keep a close eye on both of them to make sure that um, we're getting the results that we actually want from the systems. Okay, we have a question, John? Hi, um, this is John Dove. I have a, actually a comment from the black hole that Brewster pointed out of the 20th century. Uh, my, my father is long gone, but his, his main passion in life was looking at the questions of how an aggregation creates strength, how a team is stronger than the individual parts. And so much of what you are doing is actually looking at aggregation and trends that you can see from this. But then advice my father would have written about, he would have said, you've got to look at the question of how diversity within that actually has to be represented. So as you look at trends, any AI system is often looking at averages. So the question is, can you also look at what are the contrarian evidence? What's the contrarian points of view? And in the early days of Credo, we actually looked into these questions about even having something we call diversity preferent ranking which purposely was bringing forward not just the trend or the average view, but actually what are some of the contrarian views. And it's from that that you can avoid some of these kinds of mistakes where it goes off and thinks a cat is an avocado. So just a comment from the 20th century. Do our panelists want to weigh in on that? Um, live, working, okay. Um, yes, absolutely, and, and in fact, um, some researchers in AI are purposely trying to figure out how to make sure that what you might call data disruptions or irregularities are incorporated in the AI's analysis so that, they, uh, so that signal is not lost, in essence. So it's, it's really critical for that to work well, to be able to, as you suggested, to uh, be able to uh, replicate the diversity that we encounter. Uh, because if an AI ultimately is not able to do that, then it's not able to make realistic assertions. Um, so uh, just as a, a throwaway example, um, even yesterday afternoon there was a talk at uh, the Berkeley iSchool by a Microsoft researcher who has been generating new AI models that will inherently incorporate those kinds of data irregularities. Yes, we have a question. Hi. So at our institution, we're putting a tremendous amount of effort and resources into training librarians on how to do systematic reviews. Could you say who you are? Uh, Sorry. Well. Sorry. Could you introduce yourself, please? Oh, sure. Um, I'm Sarah Tandy, um, now I'm hybrid equipment. So we're doing all this training on how to do systematic reviews, and it's very uh, resource intensive, uh, not only in, in the logic of writing the queries, but going out and doing outreach. I'm curious to know whether you think that there are opportunities to put these into what you're doing with AI and what librarians are doing with systematic reviews into 
So I think bias is a really interesting area. Um, one of the things that we try and do is, and I think I'm going to pick up a little bit on John's point in terms of diverse data sets. We ingest data across all domains of information deliberately because if, for example, you read a book, you might think your book is about law, but actually you might find chapter four has some really interesting things about a different, completely different topic. So across different sets of information that get categorized at quite a high level, you actually may find that within there you get all this other information that's actually really interesting, really valuable, it just needs to be found. So I think from our perspective, in terms of using an algorithmic approach to any kind of information, you're getting this consistency and you're getting this accuracy. But I like what you said, and I think this blend of doing it that way and taking a machine perspective where you can take this enormous data set that is way beyond what any kind of individual or even a team could do in a library because you'd have to be reading these sort of tens of millions of items, but also blending that with the kind of human angle would be a really great approach. Yeah, I think, I think anywhere where you're doing this kind of manual work uh, is ripe for being assisted by AI. And I think it's the IET have a search index uh, on engineering papers and astro astronomy papers. And they're using a machine learning component in there to start assigning metadata and ontologies to their abstracting service with great effect. And their professional catalogers are finding this system is, is giving them the ability to get more content done at higher, higher levels of quality. So it's already in production with some publishers. OK, we have a question over here. Bob Holly, Princeton University. I'm glad somebody mentioned the stock market. Isn't it possible that of all these players who have very, very good use of AI come to the same predictions, by acting on those predictions, they actually change them so that they're no longer so accurate. And could things like this mean, uh, it help explain why hedge funds are suddenly doing so poorly? So, so I was at a conference earlier this year called Strata, and this topic came up, and it's called sort of data drift. So the, the things you're modeling, uh, your models can affect them and change them. And so you do need to be aware of what's the temporal level at which the underlying data and systems are going to change. So things like stock market predictions are highly volatile, and those models have to be updated with high frequency. But things like facial recognition, you know, the patterns of our faces haven't changed for thousands of years. So that's the kind of thing where your data isn't going to drift so quickly, nor is voice recognition. So it, it comes down to what domain of, of data are you operating under, and what is the uh, like uh, typical temporal shift in the patterns that that data will be represented by. So I think the, the financial services marketplace is a really interesting one. So if you go back about 10 years and you look at what hedge fund analysts were doing, they were largely ingesting um, numeric sources of information. And if you look at all information, about 10% will fall into that category and about 90% will be semantic data, which is much, much richer. So I kind of see it slightly differently. And I think that if we can use AI to take all of the unstructured information and that we can actually provide people like hedge fund managers with a much broader, more representative data set, I look at things like the subprime mortgage crisis, and you say, well, if all you're doing is ingesting these pure financial data feeds, you didn't spot that, nobody spotted that, because it was dispersed across all these huge sets of information. But if your information had contained information from regional news that people were really struggling to make their mortgage payments, could that have filtered in? Could that have helped those analysts to predict that way before it became the crisis that it was? So I, I see it a little bit differently, and I think um, that actually it could be tremendously helpful to the financial community to be able to use a much, much broader data set. Um, I, again, just, I guess, one piece of caution. Uh, you know, I, I think many people feel that the 87 crash in the stock market was uh, generated by um, a set of algorithms that were very self-similar, uh, that lacked any kind of uh, predictive understanding of, of how uh, as a community, those algorithms might uh, create results. And so there was a, a, a sell-off which generated a sell-off and, and iterating. Um, so that's an example where an AI would easily have predicted that kind of result and been able to intervene. Uh, the problem is that we're as smart as our experience. And so understanding how data drift works or how um, prediction collisions might arise in a particular AI um, is something that we don't have a lot of experience with yet, and, and we're going to have to learn um, how they misbehave. And ideally, um, you know, we'll be smart enough to uh, work in containment around our AI so that 
you know, sort of fatal consequences don't emerge. Um, I think we're running out of time, I'm sorry, over here, but um, the panelists will be around, I think, at least for the rest, rest of today. We had hoped to sort of end on a practical note, uh, what you could sort of take back to your organization, and I think the overwhelming uh, message amongst all of our contributors today was better metadata, more metadata, clean metadata, so that when we are partnering in these human AI relationships, um, they can go as smoothly as possible. So thank, thank everyone, particularly Elizabeth. Great. Um, have a great day.